And thank you for joining us on At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson, and we're very pleased to have with us the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. He is here for a very specific reason, that is to let us know about the arts and art works, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But the reason behind him coming here, we'll also talk about. <laughs> so let me welcome to the program Rocco Landisman. Great to be here, H. Uh, we might as well go, well, but let's, let's save that for just a moment. Uh, first of all, um, you're a Cardinal fan. You're, you're from St. Louis. Have been since I could talk. So I grew up listening to Harry Carey in my treehouse uh, in our country place. It's so you uh, know you've endeared yourself to half of central Illinois and you've ticked off the other half. Well, nobody's perfect. The other people, those other people I can't worry about now. <laughs> <laughs> Cubs, how are things going? Uh, wait till next year. We're going to be great. We're going to be great. I've never year. heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh, actually, your dad was a painter. He was. He had many, um, uh, many businesses, but uh, he was a great painter, and I have six of his paintings hanging in my office at the National Endowment. Uh, how much of that uh, talent did you inherit? None. Nada. Zero. So you I are... Can't, I, I, you know, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't do a decent watercolor, no. So you're not a practicing artist? Not at all. You're, but you're a champion of artists. I think that's my main job at the NEA, yes. Okay. Uh, you uh, made a statement. Um, New York Times picked it up. Uh, it started, I don't know if there's a theater in Peoria. We don't have to go I know any now. further than you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to clarify that for us? Well, of course, I was. Uh, people in Peoria know very well uh, when Peoria is being used in the kind of generic sense, uh, the old vaudeville expression, will it play in Peoria? And I was talking about, uh, you know, urban centers as opposed to other places down the vaudeville circuit, and the, hence the, the, the expression, will it play in Peoria? And I said, I don't know if there's a theater in Peoria, but I would bet it's, it's probably not as good as the Steppenwolf or the Goodman in Chicago. And um, from that pronouncement uh, has come a lot of uh, uh, back and forth, and, and of course, this trip here. Um, you received a message, an email, a generic email from Kathy Chitwood <laughs> on the, through the website and uh, Kathy and, Chit and Suzette Boulay. And Su Suzette Boulay from Arts Partners. And uh, what, what prompted you to say, I need to go to Peoria. I need to talk to Kathy and Suzette. Well, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't very particularly for Kathy and Suzette, for those two particular people. If I had gotten uh, an offended and indignant email, how dare you um, you know, talk about us this way, uh, where do you think you're coming from? Uh, had it been in that tone, uh, I wouldn't have had another, uh, another exchange with them. What I got from them was just the opposite. It wasn't all wounded indignation. It was more like, we have, do in fact have theaters in Peoria that you don't know about. There is an art scene here that you don't know about. Come out and look at it. Come out and, uh, come out and, see, and see what we're doing here. It was a very warm, welcoming um, a set of emails. And I must say, uh, it was indicative of the people that they are, as I've gotten to know them uh, since that time and through phone conversations and emails and then today in person. They are wonderful, personal, uh, engaging people. You've had an opportunity to tour uh, some artist studios. You've seen the Warehouse District in Peoria, gone to the Civic Center, met with leaders. Started the day with Pat Sullivan. You can't <laughs> do better than that. <laughs> Down at Kelleher's. <laughs> yes. We had an Irish breakfast. <laughs> Indeed we did. Um, di what, what's your take so far? You've had half a day, maybe a little more than that in Peoria. What's your take on the arts community in central Illinois? It's a surprisingly vibrant and exciting art scene. Uh, there's a lot already going on. There's a lot more that's planned. The uh, Riverfront Museum, I think, is going to be a major, major anchor to a, to a big new um, push in arts development. I think the, the warehouse district is just really at the, in the incipient phase of its development and, and uh, a place where artists can work and live. It's very exciting to see what's, what's going on, and there are, in fact, three very uh, viable and successful theaters here. Let's talk about the warehouse district in particular, because there are those who suggest that artists are the first to come into what we call displaced buildings, and they're the ones that are responsible for trying to, uh, the regentrifications, shall we say? All we're hearing about these days is the importance of small business and small businessmen. That's what artists are. They're entrepreneurs. They are individual small businessmen. And um, in, in cities, they can be magnets for, for other people moving in and, and um, an important, important part of a, um, of a city. 
You have uh, Peoria, the Peoria visit is the first of what is called the Art Works Tour. You'll be going to your hometown of St. Louis, Memphis, sure. Nashville, and some other places later. Uh, but Peoria is the kickoff. What is the Art Works Tour and what do you hope Americans take away from it? Well, at the NEA I feel that we are an agency that, is, that exists to a certain extent as an advocate for the arts in the United States. We uh, are not a typical agency. We're not uh, an enforcement agency or regulatory agency. I think we're generally viewed as the champion of the arts in the United States with, within, within the government. I know there's been a lot of back and forth of, you know, are we lobbying? No, but we, but we are to some degree representing artists in the United States government. I think that's, you know, that's part of what we do. And I came across uh, this expression that I think conveys what our, what our role is and the role of art in, uh, in the United States. And uh, because I have, you know, literary pretensions, I love a triple entendre. And artworks is that. It, it's first of all a noun. It refers to the stuff that artists create, the, what you hang on the wall and what you see on stage or what you encounter in a sculpture garden or whatever. It's the works of art, it's the stuff that, that, uh, that artists create every day and that we at the NEA are committed to supporting. Our ideal uh, activity is to support great works of art. So artworks is a noun in that, in that sense and the sort of be all and end all of what we're doing at the NEA. Secondly, it's a verb. Art works on people. It works within people. It changes people. It, it heightens their consciousness. It changes their perceptions. It can change their whole outlook or who they are, what they, you know, what they thought they might do with their lives. Uh, I remember very well going to a, uh, a, a production of Long Day's Journey into Night when I was a freshman in college. Uh, I think the, the show was at Bowdoin College. Coming out of that production, a completely different person than I was when I went in. I had really been not only affected, but to some degree transformed by, by what I had seen. I didn't know that people could talk with that degree of intensity and poetry. And I related my own life to it. And art does affect us. Art works on us as individuals. The third meaning of art works is, um, has a great deal of specificity. It has to do with artists working. That art works as a part of the economy of this country that artists are real workers, they have real jobs, they're an important part of, uh, of the economy of the United States, and that, I think, has to be recognized. You, you mentioned real jobs. Uh, I want to reflect back on a, a comment. Some, somebody was critical when they learned that of the $787 billion stimulus bill, I believe it was 50 million, you help me with the numbers, yes. but uh, that was designated for arts. Something like one six thousandth of one percent. And the response I, I exactly it shocked you. Yes, I turn on the television the next day, I, I, I turn on CNBC, and all these commentators, politicians, are saying this is a frivolous stimulus package because there's $50 million in it for the National Endowment for the Arts. And one congressman even said, how can you give $50 million for the National Endowment for the Arts when this money could be spent creating real jobs like road building? And I thought, what? Someone in the arts doesn't have a real job? If you are... Uh, someone who has worked their entire life, you have the talent, the perseverance, the dedication uh, as a musician, and you've risen to become the first violinist in a, in a symphony orchestra, like the great one here in Peoria, uh, I don't think you'd, you'd appreciate being told that you don't have a job, that you're not working, because you're working as hard or harder than anyone else. You've got kids to put into college, food to put on the table, medical expenses. You have a real job, and you're part of the real economy. And what we're gonna be saying, whether people like, people like to hear it or not, is that arts jobs are real jobs and arts are an important part of the economy. Mentioning the money, let's talk a little bit about budget. Um, NEA was um, uh, created by Congress in 1965 and how are you funded? We're funded through direct appropriations by, by Congress. And I was very happy to see that the recent appropriation uh, was uh, above the President's request, uh, $167.5 million, which I think was $6.5 million above his request and, and uh, I was very gratified by that. Uh, the highest in about 15 years yes, or so. Yes, yes. Um, and, and when you have that money, what, how, what do you use it for in terms of helping the art communities around the country? Basically, we make direct grants to arts organizations. Now, those are usually on a matching basis, so they become very leveraged. 40% of our money goes directly to the state arts agencies, which give out money according to their geographic uh, components. 
but uh, the remaining 60% is given by us directly to, to arts organizations. There are a couple of programs where we give individual grants directly to the, to the artists uh, in, in literature, or the Jazz Masters program, but generally we give to institutions. There are pretty strict matches with that, so the money becomes, becomes very leveraged. Uh, and there is some uh, imprimatur value of these grants, probably, if, uh, because they're vetted by peer review panels. And if um, there's the NEA seal of approval on, on an organization, that organization has an easier time raising other funds, usually. Uh, we want to talk a little bit more about what NEA is capable of doing, and we do have a studio audience with us as we tape this program, and uh, Mitch Williams is uh, with us. Mitch, uh, your question? Uh, thanks for uh, being here today. Sure. Um, my name is Mitch Williams again. I'm a, a full-time uh, professional entertainer and uh, um, uh, performing artist. Um, I'm concerned with the uh, perception of our, our local community as well as uh, the perception of the arts uh, nationally, as you've just been speaking of. Um, we, we do, in fact, have a vibrant arts community, as you've learned, um, but uh, unfortunately, it's one of our best-kept secrets here. Um, we, we're good at promoting ourselves uh, in this area for sporting events and for industry, uh, but Peoria is not necessarily known as a center for the arts, even though it actually is. You know, what can we do on, a, on an individual level as well as uh, influencing those in our government and, and the people that actually are positioning our city and our, our, our uh, area to, um, you know, begin promoting ourselves as a center for the arts that we truly are so that we can use that to, to bring in tourism dollars and corporate events and talent for industry. You have to get together to begin with. You mentioned uh, businesses and sports. Well, there is a chamber of commerce in business. Sports have their leagues. I think you have to get together as a group, as one solid entity that has a certain scale and a certain single voice and start making, making that voice heard. I think you can't go off in, into uh, 17 different directions if there are 17 organizations. I think you have to find a way to come, come together to speak as one to, to um, whether it's government agencies uh, or philanthropies or, or whatever. I think there is real strength in, in unity in that, uh, in that situation. Thank you. Uh, just recently, you were on uh, NPR, Morning Edition, and uh, I believe the, actually the, the phrase belongs to your predecessor, but uh, it was talking about moving arts discussion from the East Wing into the West Wing. Well, that, those are Bill Ivey's words. I, uh, I don't think it's a question of wings. I, I think that if you look at Michelle Obama's statements about the arts, they go well beyond uh, what we think of as the East Wing. She, she has talked about how vital the arts are to uh, our soul uh, in this country, how, how it's important part of our, uh, of our national character, that it's not an extra, it's not an add-on. And I think she has been trying very hard to move the arts front and center into the, uh, into the discussion. Both she and her husband are very committed to the, to the arts. They've made that very clear. The, the president, when he was candidate Obama, had an arts advisory council and an arts policy, very, very unheard of for a, a pres presidential candidate. She is very committed to the role of the arts in our society and to the importance of arts education. So I don't think it's, it's East Wing, West Wing. I think it's uh, two people who are very, very committed to the, to the arts in this country. And, and that's, it's, frankly, that's one of the reasons I, I, I went down to Washington to take this job. While you have uh, supporters of uh, arts funding and supporters of NEA, uh, there are those who are contrary. Um, Glenn Beck's been um, beating you up pretty badly, if I may use that term. There was an August 10th conference call. A uh, young man by the uh, name of uh, Patrick Corielsch uh, was on Glenn Beck's program, mm -hmm. and he apparently taped uh, what appears to be this conference call. And Glenn Beck takes you to task um, for because of a statement that was made by a representative of NEA, and correct us if this is incorrect, uh, that the artists are encouraged to do art that represents one of the four administration initiatives. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned that that was on August 10th. My first day of work was August 11th. <laughs> <laughs> so I inherited that. Uh, I think uh, that that guy was a little bit in his um, campaign fatigues at the time. Still, he'd been working in the campaign. Uh, I think he actually meant well. I don't think he meant to say that you, you, know, you should go out and advocate for specific uh, administration programs, but some of the stuff 
uh, that he said came out uh, badly. I'm, I'm sure he would like to have that back. But um, the arts, uh, the, the National Endowment for the Arts is not uh, an advocacy agency in the sense that we're going to go out and promote different programs within the administration. That would be way over the line. We have no intention of, uh, of, of doing that. But it's typical of Glenn Beck that when I made a statement like the one I just made, like the NEA would, would never do that, his answer was, yeah, sure, right. And then he played Yossi Sargent's comments from the day before I arrived at the, uh, at, at the NEA as, as, as proof that I was, you know, was lying. Um, that kind of attack, which is uh, which we've heard before, we heard a lot of it in the 1950s and early 60s. Um, so and so associates with so and so, who associates with so and so, who has this agenda in mind or advocates for this, uh, and building this kind of uh, conspiracy case. Uh, that's not the kind of dialogue I'm interested in even even answering. It's uh, it's so ridiculous. Uh, you uh, are going to take an uh, artworks tour to St. Louis and then to Memphis. And I want to talk a little bit about regional art and how we can establish uh, pockets of art. For instance, blues music from Chicago to Memphis all the way down to New Orleans. And that's pretty much where you saw the evolution of blues music. Or if you go over for, for let's take printmaking. Printmaking, uh, the design of printmaking had a, a, the University of Iowa is the focal point for that. And I'm sure Boston and San Francisco and others have their little niches. Um, how, how do you go about making sure that regions maintain their identity? Well, I think the, one of the main missions of the NEA is to support wonderful art wherever we find it, wherever it comes from. I happen to be a country music fanatic. Uh, I have a career because of Roger Miller, who is from, uh, from Eric, Oklahoma. He wrote the score for my first show, which was Big River. And I remember going out to the opening of the Roger Miller Museum in Eric, Oklahoma, where Roger grew up. And you arrive at the airport in Oklahoma City, and you drive to Eric, you know, it's 140 miles or something, and you go not only to the birthplace of Roger Miller, but you pass the birthplaces of Garth Brooks and Jimmy Webb and Sheb Woolley, who was one of the founders of rock and roll, an area that doesn't have much in the way of uh, uh, educational facilities or music conservatories or anything like that. It's fairly barren uh, country and yet it produces these incredible talents. So you never know where the next exciting and interesting uh, art or artist is going to come from. It's, it's always a surprise and we at the NEA have to be there and ready for whenever and wherever. Uh, Sheb Woolley, rock and roll. Didn't he write Purple People Eater? He did indeed. Uh, that's what I thought. One-eyed, one-horned, flying Purple People Eater. <laughs> See, we are the same age, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. Alas. <laughs> well, then let's talk about young people. Uh, Molly Smith is in the audience, and Molly has a question that regards it, it, to, to people that are a little bit younger than you and me. Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, first Molly. off, thank you so much for coming to Peoria. I'm very excited to have you here. I'm having a great day here. <laughs> uh, my question has to do with the young people. What advice would you give to young actors and actresses that would like to make theater and musical theater more than just a hobby? Well, first of all, you have to have a tremendous amount of perseverance. And you never know at what point perseverance becomes something irrational and, uh, and crazy. But every, everyone who embarks on a, on a career in the, in the theater as an actor has to, has to have that. What I think happens a lot of times is that uh, you end up forming your own companies that you get together with a group of like-minded people, you find a director or designer, and you put on shows. You, you, you in effect, form a theater and, uh, and, and do it for yourselves because it's often very hard to get noticed in, in some of the, uh, uh, the big centers where, you know, that's where it's all about uh, getting agents and, and, and all of that. I think a, 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 a valuable thing you can be, can be doing is, is starting your own organizations and putting on, putting on your own shows. How would you do that? Well, you have to raise a little money, okay. uh, as anybody who starts an organization does. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. The great thing about theater, as opposed to a lot of the other art forms, is it doesn't take much. You know, f a, f a few lights and a, uh, and, and a stage. And, um, you know, you can do that in a small way. And if you have some things that catch on or that people want to see, you can, you, can, uh, you can build it up over time. Thank you very much. Sure. L let's talk a more about young people. Um, does the NEA play a role, an, an educational component, in terms of helping people who are going to school? Yes. The uh, NEA has an educational department. Uh, it's headed by a, a, a very, very capable woman named Sarah Cunningham. And this is one of our main centers of interest. We care very much about arts education. 
One of the real problems I've, I've had with, uh, and I don't want this to come off in a partisan way, it, it, I guess it could be interpreted that way, but uh, the whole No Child Left Behind program, in my opinion, leaves behind quite a few. The, the whole notion that you should be training instructors to instruct to success on uh, standardized tests in, in uh, reading and math uh, seems to me to miss a lot of kids. It leaves a lot of kids behind, in fact. Uh, what about the kid who has a, uh, uh, a talent or a, a special passion or, or an idiosyncratic point of view about things? There, there are kids who uh, don't fit in or fall between the cracks of conventional testing that the arts catches. These kids need to have a place in society too, need to have a role. Now, people know this instinctively. Mothers will, 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 will save money in the most unlikely places so they can give their kids piano lessons, music lessons of all kinds. They know that instinctively, but we don't know it on a programmatic basis. We don't know it as policy. And I think one of the things we want to do at the NEA is to put that into policy, to really make a strong case for arts education. We've talked uh, in the past, uh, amongst many of us, uh, we've talked amongst ourselves about how Gee whiz, uh, having the arts in education helps you in math, it helps you in science, it helps you in English. Is there any data that, that really says, yes, arts is critical to the education in other arenas? Yes, there, I, can't, I can't, you know, give you that off the top of my fingers, numbers, but, but, but yes, there's a considerable body of evidence that arts helps you in all kinds of ways. And one of the most exciting moments I've had since I became chairman of the NEA was going down to New Orleans and visiting the Lusher School which we would call, I guess, an art school. They don't think of themselves as an art school. They, to them, the arts are so ingrained in a part of their daily life that you wouldn't even call it arts. And they start their day with an outdoor, uh, it's not a recess because you haven't been in school, but they begin with an outdoor assembly in which the music teacher comes down with an electric guitar and they sing Fats Domino songs for uh, six or seven minutes. And they go to school in an incredibly elevated and excited state of mind to begin with. And then all the rest of the day, the arts are an integrated part of that curriculum, not just in arts or in English, but also in science and math and language. The arts are totally woven into the curriculum, totally integrated into it. And these kids end up going to better high schools and better colleges than any of the other kids in the area. And it's a great success. And I think it's something that uh, everybody in the country should look at. We've mentioned New Orleans a couple of times. I want to share something with you. There's a place called Rock and Bowl in New Orleans. It's a bowling alley on the second floor of a building. But up and coming musicians get to perform at the Rock and Bowl. And so people are bowling and they might Love have it. a beverage or two, but they're learning about different kinds of music at the same time. That's great. Let, let's talk about economic impact. Um, how many, do we, do we have a measurement of how many people work in the arts in America? 5.7 million hold full-time arts-related jobs. That's a lot. Compare that to another industry. I mean, like the transportation industry, for instance. Someone was saying that, that if you add up uh, not only the, the transportation uh, industry, but also you know, the, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other industries, that, that, uh, you know, that, that the automobile building industry, uh, for, for instance, um, that all of them together don't equal the number of people uh, employed by, uh, by the arts. Um, staying on the economic impact, um, we, we know that communities like to support the arts, they traditionally have, but we just saw Chicago, at least in their preliminary budget, cut their arts funding by 50%. Illinois Arts Council, I believe, is a 47% cut. Uh, this doesn't bode well. Can the NEA do anything, and I don't mean step in with money, but it, can you do anything to try to make sure that we don't lose our focus? Those cuts are very alarming. It's always a concern. We've, we've seen this in school curricula. The first thing that's cut is the arts. It should be the last thing that's cut. And you're saying the same thing on the state budget levels. The first thing that's cut are, is arts funding because that's considered the most extraneous, the most frivolous. We feel it's the most essential. And uh, it's very alarming to see this trend. We hope that it'll reverse somewhat uh, with, with a comeback in the, in the economy. But we all have to make the case that the arts are an important part of our, our daily life, an important part of who we are, and uh, deserve support. A final comment. Um, first of all, we want you to come back to Peoria. I, I'm going to make this an annual, uh, annual trip. You I, I, I'd love to hold here. you to that. Absolutely. All you right. should. And um, just a final word to those aspiring artists out there. Hang in there. Hang in there. It's a tough time now. We're going to get through this. Um, we're, we're, we're going to, uh, there's going to be a better future, and it's, it's going to be okay. 
Rocco Landisman, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time here in Peoria and on that issue. Thanks, H. And we'll be, our, our audience wants to applaud, that's okay. They can go ahead and do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I just got it. Hold on. And, and we're going to uh, have uh, Ken Hinton, who is the superintendent of District 150 Schools in Peoria, join us on the next Ad Issue. A week from now, we'll be discussing uh, his retirement and his view as to what District 150 should do in the near future. Thank you for joining us on Ad Issue.